If you have ideas for classes or uh, instructors and you want to let us know, you can always email me at rachelwhirling at oregonstate.edu. Um, easy to find if you just Google. So uh, this evening's presentation is one of our community education series. We are based in Jackson County. I know folks might be from all over the place these days. Um, we will have in the background, Marcy Kamiker is our education committee chair and she'll be the co-host of the Zoom. If something goes wrong um, during the Zoom, she'll be here to pick up the rain. So if suddenly someone else is kind of emceeing our program tonight, that's uh, what's going on there. So don't worry about it. Um, we encourage you to Google OSU Land Steward Program and scroll down on the main screen and click the join and sign up for our email list if you haven't done that to hear about upcoming events. The lots of different things that we have coming up. For example, um, our upcoming classes, August 9th, we have a two-part program on designing a rainwater collection system. Um, an in-person, not Zoom available as far as I know, um, class and then a field program. So. That's August 9th. And then I did want to take just a couple of minutes because this fall we will have um, our 2023 Land Steward Field trainings, Training is going to be going, and that is really our flagship program. It's an 11-week, 11 five-hour classes uh, training that covers most of the topics that you would run into if you have rural land. You assess your land. Um, you create a, a stewardship management plan. You can have a mentor visit if you want. You get lots of books and resources. You get um, connected to many technical resources and people who help support land, land stewardship, land management, natural resource management in our area. It's really just a terrific program. Um, and if you can fit that into your schedule, it's really worth it if you have land, whether you're new to your land, especially if you're new to your land. But even if you've been doing it for a long time, there's really a tremendous value in that program. And again, you can just find it on our website. Registration is open now. And there's a $50 early bird discount um, now through August 1st. So beyond that training, more community classes coming up. We have Oaks Below Ground on September 13th, Heirloom Apples on October 11th, and Propagating Native Plants from Seeds. So those are all um, classes kind of similar to this, two-hour classes or so. So with that, we can turn our attention to this evening's uh, presentation called Why Natives? Seven Steps to Restore Biodiversity in Our Gardens and Yards. And this is going to be with the wonderful Lynn Kuntzman, who is one of our terrific master gardeners. And I'm just going to read her bio here. Lynn um, has a bachelor's degree in wildlife management from Humboldt State University, where I also got my bachelor's degree, and a master's degree in science education from SOU. She's a master gardener and a master food preserver. Her home garden is certified as a monarch way station, a pollinator garden, and a wildlife habitat. She established and directs the native plant nursery at the Jackson County Extension Campus. Okay, so with that, I will stop my share here. And Lynn will share her screen. And if you have any issues or questions, go ahead and just drop things into the chat and we'll help you from there. And then you are on mute. You're still muted. Yes, I'm having a little bit of a difficulty. There we go. No worries. <laughs> Bear with me. Yeah, uh, not a problem. <laughs> yeah, check my view here. There we go. Okay. Uh, let me get you back to the slideshow. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all, or not see you all, as the case may be. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, I keep clicking this the wrong way. So I, I, I'd like to start this presentation with- uh, No, we're not, we're not seeing your presentation yet. You have to share your screen. I'm not oh sure dear. you meant to oh, yet. No. All right, oh, no. no worries, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had shared it. Oh, we're here for you, yeah. <laughs> okay, more, here we go. All right. Can you see me now? All right. Yes, but you need to uh, swap the presentation view if you have it in. 
Oh yeah. There we go. Looking good. Perfect. Right. Yay. <laughs> you are good. Okay. Right. I will just okay, you and right. step in the background here. All good? Yep. All good. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. And um, I like to start these presentations with this little quote from Helen Keller that I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. And um, the reason that I, that I use this quote is because this presentation is about changing the way we approach our gardening and, um, and, the, and our land use and those kinds of things and how, how we deal with things in our own landscapes. And so this is the one thing that we can all do and um, Hopefully, this will empower you to think think of it differently and um, make some changes. Now I can't go forward. There we go. So um, this is a presentation based on um, a book called Nature's Best Hope by Dr. Doug Tallamy. He is a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware. Um, and I got some of my pictures from Tom Landis and Susie Savoy, so I want to take them. Give props to them. So, uh, Hope for the Wild is this uh, book. Um, uh, well, actually, Nature's Best Hope is the book. And the link here in this presentation, which you can get a copy of, um, I'm happy to share the slide decks with you, uh, is his, he's on YouTube and he does these presentations all over the country. And um, his message is very clear about um, the choices we need to make as, as landowners, as homeowners, as gardeners, um, about the plants that we put in our landscapes. And so the problem, just as a short uh, introduction and why should we even care about what we're sticking in our yards, um, we are right in the midst of, I know you've all heard of the Anthropocene, uh, uh, the new, epoch that we are now in and um, part of that um, situation is that we're having an insect apocalypse worldwide insect numbers are down uh, in some places 45 percent of insects have disappeared from um, environments um, in some streams um, around the world 96 percent of aquatic insects so it is a huge uh, kind of ecological collapse that we're watching um, loss of habitat loss of birds and other wildlife. We're all aware of those things. Um, they come at us every day. We see those statistics. Um, and we need to talk about the drivers of that loss. And those drivers are industrial agriculture, where we now you know, plow uh, road to road, fence line to fence line, uh, with no uh, break in the uh, monoculture roads and their hazards, those are direct hazards to wildlife, turtles and, and things crossing the road, things getting hit on the road, we've all done that. Unnecessary lights, which is hugely important and we'll talk about near the end of the presentation. Um, tens of million acres of sterile lawn, and this for some people is a big uh, new fact that they've never considered. And then widespread destruction and displacement of native plants. Um, so lots of things going on that we need to address. So we can't survive without insects that support all of our food webs and provide pollination services. These are honeybees, which when people think pollinators, they always think honeybees. Well, they're a non-native um, introduced species to North America. North America has several thousand species of native bees. And these over on the right are just a sprinkling of those. Oregon alone has almost 800 species of native bee, and they are actually better pollinators uh, than the honeybees are. So how can we turn all of this problem around? Um, as we go through this slide presentation, you're going to see plants and some animals. Here's a dagger moth on um, our horse mint, Hagasaki or Urticifolia. Um, and you'll see some pink numbers with parentheses around them. 
those are the number of, and this is a low one for Agastaki, I know it hosts more than that. Um, those are the numbers of insects, uh, moths and butterflies in particular, that that plant hosts. So keep an eye on those numbers as we move along through the presentation because um, it's, it's eye-opening. So the, the good news, I've given you a lot of bad news. <laughs> the good news is that we can um, reverse the insect decline and, um, and save our beautiful birds. And the reason I focus on birds is because insects are the primary food for birds, particularly birds in the nest have to eat insects, they cannot eat seeds. So um, we wanna be able to save our little, our little flighted dinosaurs that are in our yard. Okay, we do that by making our yards look like this. Uh, our public spaces, our own yards and gardens, um, instead of like this. These are sterile yards. When you put in a lawn like this and you put in balls and boxes, you know, to decorate the edge, those are plants from other continents and um, basically you're sterilizing your environment. So here's red flowering currant. This is one of our lovely native shrubs. Um, it hosts about 80 uh, different Lepidoptera species. So you can focus on the land that's easiest for you to fix. And that is the land that you own, right? You have control over that. Most of the property in North America is in private hands. And so if you're feeling overwhelmed by everything that's coming at you uh, in, in, the, in the day of climate change and, uh, and the Anthropocene, know that on your property, you get to control it. You, you get to make the choices. All right. So native insects specialize on eating native plants. Um, and, and these relationships have occurred, have, have, have progressed and come about over millennia. It takes tens of thousands of years for these relationships to, to come to where they are today. Um, they specialize on eating native plants. Our native insects in North America have to eat native plants. So 90% of the insects that eat plants can develop and reproduce only on the plants with which they share an evolutionary history. Some of our insects can make the switch over to some European or African or Asian uh, things that we bring in and stick in the garden. But for the most part, they, most of them have to eat what was here on the continent before uh, the arrival of um, these uh, non-indigenous plants. Oh, I wanna just quickly point out that this, this plant is Aristolochia californica. This is the Dutchman's pipe or California pipe vine, riparian species. Um, it is a vining plant, as you can see, cute little Dutchman's pipe. Those are, those are pollinated by fungus gnats. Our little garden enemies uh, are critical for this plant's pollination services. Um, and it is the sole host plant for this beautiful blue butterfly, the California pipe vine swallowtail. If you want California pipe vine swallowtails in your yard, you must plant this plant. Otherwise, they will not come because the females are looking for that to lay their eggs on. So native plants have adapted to our hungry, hungry caterpillars. Uh, they get along just fine. Um, and like it or not, uh, gardeners are gonna have to become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. So we have a role to play. So here are the seven steps you can take to make a difference and help save nature. So that's basically your homework for tonight. You're, everybody's gonna go and, and do, do some or all of these things to help uh, preserve biodiversity. So remove at least half your lawn. People get up in arms because they like their lawns. And I get that people need their lawns for the kids to play in, um, but they don't support native insects. They don't build or protect the soil at all. Uh, they waste and pollute water by, we overwater them all the time, water's running down. And um, chemical runoff to streams is highly polluting and is uh, degrading the, uh, the purity of the streams around us. And they pollute the air because of lawnmowers and leaf blowers. Those two cycle engines uh, don't have catalytic converters on them and they, they create a lot of pollution. So 
Here's a little uh, you know, fact sheet about the staggering wastefulness of the American lawn. 45 million acres of lawn in America, that's twice over twice the acreage that we have in national parks. 2 billion gallons of gas for lawn equipment, 41 billion pounds of CO2 emitted from leaf blowers, this is in a year, 13 billion pounds of toxic and carcinogenic air pollutants emitted from the leaf blowers and mowers, 100 million pounds of pernicious lawn chemicals and fertilizers, and 9 billion gallons of water per day, per day. And if you're in a municipality or a suburb, you're using potable water to irrigate a lawn, a sterile lawn. Um, and then you repeat that every year. Right, so uh, enormous waste. And we wouldn't have lawns this big if we didn't have these kinds of pieces of equipment. When people had to push a real, you know, hand pushed, no power lawnmower, people had much smaller lawns. So this is a new, this is really a new thing. So if you can make your yard look like this, you can mow part of it, leave part of a lawn for walking or playing or maybe something like this, where you have a big play area here, and then this is given over to some kind of habitat for the other creatures that, that share our world. So this is a comparison of turf grasses versus native grass or native plant, plant roots. Uh, here's turf grass, you can see it's got a six to eight inch uh, root system. Nothing much holding the soil down here, but if you plant natives, look at all the roots. These go down 10, 15 feet uh, in most cases. So um, they are what bind the soil. That is why we had those deep, rich prairie soils in the American Midwest. These were the plants that were out there. These were the plants that were holding that soil in place. Once it was plowed, then it blew into Washington during the Dust Bowl. So um, an important thing to remember, native plants really help hold the soil and build soil health. If we don't have, um, we don't have to water native plants as often because <laughs> those roots go way down and they tap into water that you don't even know is down there in the soil uh, profile. And they help control flooding. So if we removed just half, only half of the lawns in the United States. We'd have more and planted native plants. Um, we would have more native acreage than Everglades, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Canyon, Mount Rainier, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, North Cascade, Badlands, Olympic, Sequoia, Denali, and Great Smoky National Park combined because we only have 20 million acres of of national park land. So um, we could double, if everybody did this, every single person who had a lawn took out half and planted it with natives, we double uh, and, and we would have homegrown national parks, we double the amount of uh, land. So when you think about your yard, most yards look kind of like this picture on the left. And um, that's kind of, well, maybe what your yard looks like now, hopefully not. Um, what we're hoping is that your yard soon will look like this. Now, of course, uh, with fire safety, you might be removing these shrubs next to the house because you want to have a uh, hardened perimeter around your house for, for fire safety. But that's okay. So that's a hardscape that you're putting around there instead of those shrubs. But we could still put these shrubs out in the safe perimeter around your house. And then if everybody in the neighborhood starts doing that, eventually you start to stitch together this continuous ecosystem where birds can actually reproduce and corridors where wildlife can move safely through neighborhoods and cityscapes and those sorts of areas. And we know the wildlife is out there. It's coming through our yards anyway. We might as well give it protection and welcome it. So step two, that was step one, remove half the lot. Step two, as much as possible, remove non-native and invasive, particularly invasive plants. Um, and this is a link to Garden Smart Oregon, a guide to non-invasive plants where they 
show you an invasive plant and they show you something you can you can remove that plant and replace it with something that will be um, a native and non-invasive. This is fennel. Of course, we grow it in our gardens. <clears throat> it gets out of our gardens very easily. It's all over out there in the wild because the birds eat the seed, you know, and they carry it around. Um, this is butterfly bush <laughs> in the Calmeopsis wilderness. Uh, and it is just rampant out there. Uh, it never it wasn't planted there by anybody. It was dropped by a bird, right? And uh, somebody planted one of these in their yard in Grants Pass, and then the bird ate it and flew out here. And now it's being spread all over in this wildland area. And uh, people go hiking out there and they think, oh, that's a native plant. No, it's not. It's an invasive non-native. Really important to understand that uh, a native plant cannot be invasive. It can be aggressive in your yard. It can be a garden thug in your yard because it's native and it likes where you put it and it just goes nuts. But a native plant can never be invasive unless it's, unless it's being planted on the other side of the country where it's not native, right? But any Oregon native plant um, and any local native plant is never invasive. What's invasive are the things that we brought into the country or from other parts of our country that have gotten away and are now wreaking havoc in the ecosystem. So very important to know the difference between invasiveness and aggressiveness. Here's more invasive stuff. You've all seen this, the Portland forest being choked by English ivy, Scotch broom, which we see on our hillsides everywhere. English laurel also out there in, with the ivy in the forest nasty, nasty, nasty stuff in the nurseries. Now they finally have outlawed the sale of English ivy in Oregon, but of course the genie's out of the bottle. It's already out there doing all the damage, right? The nurseries can't sell it anymore, so the industry has had to stop producing it. Um, industry has also, they've outlawed butterfly bush. Butterfly bush, now you can only buy, this is in quotes, sterile, um, sterile butterfly bush. Don't believe anything that, that says it's sterile. Bradford pear was supposed to be sterile. It's, it's not sterile. It always finds, nature finds a way and those things escape and they cause horrible damage to ecosystems. So step three, so you you've removed half the lawn, you've taken out the invasive plants that you might have accidentally put in your yard because you just didn't know when you went to the nursery. Step three is to plant native plants. And this is our beautiful Philadelphia Sluicia. It's called mock orange. Don't go to the nursery and ask for mock orange. They're gonna give you the one, the mock orange from China. Never ask for a plant by the common name. Please do your research, get the scientific name and go to the nursery and ask for that. It's a lovely shrub and it hosts um, four, this, my, my notes say four, I know it's more than that. Um, insects. So the point about uh, if you're like me, <laughs> the way I gardened for years and years and years until 2017, in fact, when I saw Dr. Tallamy's presentation on YouTube, I would go to the nursery, I'd pick out a plant, I think, oh, I've got to have that, that's beautiful, that's so gorgeous, you know, that Japanese barberry or that whatever pretty purple plant. And I would pick it for its decorative value or because I wanted it as a screen, I'd get Photinia uh, or I'd get, you know, uh, uh, Arborvitae or, I, you know, some focal point, I'll get, a, I'll get myself a, um, some beautiful plant that I can put in the front yard and anchor. And I only use these criteria for choosing plants. And it never occurred to me that there were other criteria I needed to be thinking about. And those criteria are these. We need to think about the ecological services that those plants provide. If a plant is only being decorative in our yard, it is not providing the ecological services we need it to. It's not sequestering carbon. It may be sequestering some because plants take carbon into their tissues. That's how they, that's how they photosynthesize. They're taking in CO2. Soil restoration, most non-natives are not building soil. Weather protection, pollinator habitat, this is a big one. Uh, our native plants provide this. Most non-natives do not. Watershed value, in other words, um, preventing flooding and, and 
encouraging water infiltration in those deep roots. Native plants do that. Those deep roots help the water get down into the soil. Wildlife appreciation and food web value. This is the giant one. Our food webs are starting to collapse and it's because our insects are disappearing. If you don't have these native plants, this goes away and that's a huge problem. So native plants build the soil and they hold the soil. So soil restoration and carbon sequestration. Here are native grasses pumping carbon down into the soil, feet down into the soil. That carbon, once it's down there, can stay there for thousands of years. It's not going to go away, even if those roots uh, decompose and get utilized by microorganisms and stuff. It's still down there. It's not going off up here in the atmosphere. So this is the monoculture of agriculture. And you can see no soil building, no soil restoration. No, it's not sequestering any carbon because all of this is going off. All right, provide the native plants provide food for native insects. So 90%, as I said before, of our insects have to feed on native plants. Here's a snake moth nectaring at our beautiful uh, native camas lily, just a gorgeous moth and a gorgeous flower, spring flower. Native caterpillars have to eat native plants. Uh, when a female butterfly comes through a site, she is looking for the plant family or genus that she must lay her eggs on. And every caterpillar, every, every Lepidoptera in North America is, is tied intimately to either a family of plants or even a genus of plants. So this is red twig dogwood and there are 58 different Lepidoptera species that will lay their eggs on this plant. Put this in your yard, 58 species of butterfly and moth in your yard. And caterpillar are essential to most bird re, uh, group reproduction. So um, here are little titmice and bush chits, really darling little tiny birds. Um, that need to feed caterpillars to their young in the nest. Um, they forage in the branches of trees and shrubs. So you want to include trees and shrubs, and they're often found in mixed flocks with many other species of birds that are called gleaning gills. And they glean insects for food. So the adults eat insects as they're gleaning, but they also are looking for caterpillars to take back to the nest to feed their baby birds. So we don't want to go. So here's an example. Chickadee weighs um, 0.35 ounces. That's about four pennies. Think about holding four pennies in your hand. That's what that little bird weighs. This is a Carolina chickadee. But we have a, a chickadee, a, an analogous chickadee here in the West. We have our own chickadee. And to rear one clutch of young, <clears throat> a pair of chickadees has to catch between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to feed those babies while they're in the nest. Then the babies come out of the nest, they fledge, and the parents continue to feed them for three weeks. So it's thousands, tens of thousands of caterpillars that these little guys are having to, to forage. If they, met, if they have two or three nests a year, truly tens of thousands of caterpillars. So if you want chickadees, you need to grow the trees and the shrubs that grow the caterpillars that they eat. So why caterpillars, Lynn? You keep harping about caterpillars. Why, why is that such a big deal? Well, um, uh, it could be because they're really beautiful. I mean, that might be why the birds are looking for them. Uh, probably not. Could be because they have cool names and there they are. All the, all the cool and painted lady. And oh, there's that white vine swallowtail again, Batis Philanor. Um, they have great names, but really, um, the reason caterpillars are important is because they are soft, they are large, they are high in protein, high in fats. They're the best source of carotenoids, which are the chemicals that birds need to make their feather color. And they're easy to stuff down a baby bird's throat. They're like a big, soft bratwurst, right? The exoskeleton on a caterpillar is soft and squishy. 
The exoskeleton on a beetle is like a tank. You don't want to put that in a little baby bird's throat. The, the caterpillars are much better. So they are the preferred food of 95% of our songbirds. Um, so there can't be any chickadees where there aren't enough caterpillars. And we want more than chickadees. And most other birds are a lot, a lot bigger. So our warblers, we want warblers. These are our Western warblers. They glean insects uh, off the branches and leaves of, oh, guess again, trees and shrubs. Look at that. There's coffee berry. 21 insects that that, uh, caterpillars that that hosts. Thrushes, there are our bluebirds and our robins and our hermit thrushes and our buried thrushes. And they hunt through the leaf litter of trees and shrubs. Again, trees and shrubs, very important. Woodpeckers, we want woodpeckers. They're really big birds. They eat a lot of food. Uh, lots and lots of caterpillars needed for them. They drill into tree chunks and they, the, wood, the acorn woodpeckers gather and store acorns. And the, lots of woodpeckers fly catch as well. So, and then our little wrens, they're, they're going from the canopy to the ground. They're in dense vegetation, also hunting for insect food. Jays, ravens, magpies, crows, big birds. They need a lot of food. Vireos. These groups forage ground to treetops. So we need to think about vertical as well as horizontal planting. So there's that lawn again, that just that horizontal lawn, really pretty worthless. We need vegetation. We need ground cover. We need herb layer. We need perennials. We need shrubs. We need trees. So understory and overstory, canopy kinds of situations. Flycatchers need open kind of grassy meadow areas to go out and catch the insects that are flying over those tall grasses. And that's how they do it. They just go out and catch them right on the wing. So host plant choice matters. Uh, we're choosing host plants. And here are some examples. Um, Here's service berry. It hosts 81 species of Lepidoptera, moths and caterpillars, or moths and butterflies. Um, we add caterpillars to the landscape by adding the native plants that make the caterpillars. Here's Ceanothus, 93 species of a moth and butterfly hosted. This is <coughs> willow, which is one of our, in the West, probably our keystone tree. Uh, keystone being that, um, most important member of the ecosystem that this is important. It's a keystone tree for bees as well as moths and butterflies. So um, the pollen pollen seeking bees utilize that early in the spring, our native bees. Um, so a keystone plant, this is our white oak. And keystone plant, remember, refers to that in the Roman arch. That stone that if you pull it out, <laughs> like the wolves in Yellowstone, or the beavers out of our rivers, or the oaks and willows out of our ecosystems, this entire structure collapses. So everything else falls as we remove those keystone individuals. So um, Dr. Tellamy did this study on his property of caterpillars on a 14-year-old, not a, a a plant he planted from an acorn, 14 year old white oak, and he counted the number of species um, on that oak. And so here were all the species of different, different species. So 19 species, and oh, sorry, um, 19 species and um, 410 caterpillars. Plenty of food there on that very small oak tree, not, not real big, plenty of food there for birds to forage. Oh, and by the way, if this um, if the leaf rollers or leaf folders have a bad year and they aren't on the tree, you still have all these other individuals there uh, as a food source for the birds that are looking for nestling food. Here's black cherry. He did the same thing with a black cherry on his property that he had planted. And he found three, uh, 239 caterpillars, 14 different species, um, plenty of food there were all the little guys that were looking for food for, for babies. Um, we have uh, native Western cherries, uh, Prunus. Um, once again, one of those keystone species, 240 different species here in the West. 
of Lepidoptera that are hosted. We have bitter cherry, choke cherry, Klamath plum. There's what bitter cherry looks like, really pretty bark. Here's what our choke cherry looks like in fall color. And here's what the Klamath plum looks like. And these apparently make very nice jam. I've never tried it, but uh, apparently it's, it's quite tasty. So put it in your food forest, feed the birds and feed yourself. Here's, uh, then he went and he, he did a study on a Bradford pear and he found um, 11 caterpillars of one species. This is a, um, you know, they say that Bradford pear is sterile. The tree itself is sterile. It's not, it's now the most invasive species on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. It's castrating all kinds of ecosystems out there. Uh, it's harder for it to do that here in the West because we have such a dry environment. But this is a this is a worthless bird feeder for for birds. There's nothing here that birds can utilize. Um, so very problematic plant. Um, so instead of planting a Bradford pear in your uh, town, like Ashland is full of Bradford pears all over the campus up there. Um, too bad they didn't plant um, black hawthorn, um, our native black hawthorn provides food for caterpillars and for birds, um, um, adult birds in the form of berries. This is burning bush, an invasive non-native species in Oregon. Uh, caterpillars on burning bush, uh, leaf skeletonizers, they'll eat it. Um, so 44 caterpillars, one species, not a bird feeder, very bad. And if we add caterpillars to the suburban ecosystems by planting native vegetation they need, we will be breeding birds and that's the, that is the critical message. You don't just want birds in your yard, you want breeding birds. And for them to be able to breed, they have to be able to forage for food within 150 feet or so of their nest site because they're bringing back caterpillars from dawn to dusk to feed the young. So breeding birds, the only way you can have breeding birds is by putting these native plants into your landscape. You don't need to rip out all your non-native plants. I grow a mix of both on my um, stupid corner lot in Medford. I hate corner lots. I will never ever uh, buy another one. Hate, hate, hate. Anyway, uh, my front yard is a um, pollinator garden, certified pollinator garden, monitor waste station, and wildlife habitat. Um, but but I have these things. These are non-native. I have butterfly weed and swamp milkweed from, these are two milkweeds from the Eastern part of the United States. They can't get away because they need wetter sites, but I'm irrigating a lot of my yard. And so I can grow those. Monarda also is a North American native, but, it, but I can grow it in my yard because I'm watering perennial beds. Um, calendulas, Campanula, I have creeping phlox, well, our creeping phlox, we have a native creeping phlox here. Um, I have daylilies, I have iris, bearded iris. I've taken out the butterfly bush, the oregano, which is also invasive, and the fennel, that's why they're crossed out there. I'm removing those every time I see them in my yard. Um, but sage, rosemary, thyme, those are, those are um, foods that we use in cooking. And I encourage people to grow herbs and certainly not buy your herbs in a clamshell, four sprigs of sage in a plastic shell at the grocery store. You can grow them in a pot on your patio and they're great. And the honeybees will love them. And then these are the natives that I grow. Um, and this is just a partial list. I have a lot more than this. And I recently landscaped my, my son's uh, yard next door. My son lives next door. We get his front yard in a native landscape. And so there are we're trying to stitch the neighborhood together a little bit. Um, so lots of lots of choice that you have when you when you decide you want to make some changes. This is a mountain lilac or deer brush. Ninety three different butterflies and moths lay their eggs in this. So if you make insects, you are supporting life. So there are some of the butterflies that mountain lilac coasts. So a diversity of core genera of keystone native plants is key in Southern Oregon. So I have a pamphlet that I can send to you that I made from, um, from Dr. Talamy's presentation. And, and 
um, it lists the 20 top <clears throat> insect producing native plants that we grow here in the, uh, that we can grow here in the Rogue Valley. Um, so if you if you have a lot of land and because you're land stewards, most of you have some property, unlike me, I've got a corner lot, I can't put all these things on my little quarter acre lot, but you can, if you can plant a willow down in a wet site away from your house pipes, you have 312 species of <clears throat> butterfly and moth now that you're hosting and, uh, and providing pollen, early pollen for bees. If you add a cherry, um, now you've added that suite of insects that use the cherries, um, and you now have 552 species of moth and butterfly that are available for bird food. Add a poplar tree, and you've now upped the number of species that you're growing on your land to 779. Add an alder, add an oak, add a pine. Every time you add something out of a new family of, of uh, plants, you're adding a new suite of Lepidoptera to your landscape. Add a birch, add a blueberry, add a caneberry, rubus. If you add just these 10 plants to your landscape, you ha will have added this many species of, potentially, this many species of butterfly and moth to your yard, garden, acreage, or whatever you're planting in. And see you know this 19, so 1900, 1900 different species of caterpillar. Pretty good, pretty easy with 10 species. So I tell people when you go to the nursery, when you make a choice about a plant, you are, when you buy a plant, you're buying a bird feeder. So the willow um, hosts 312 species of caterpillar. So if you choose willow, oh, your bird feeder is full, right? Pretty good choice. If you choose a ginkgo and they're beautiful, I understand that. And people go, well, they were, uh, they're native here a million years ago. Yeah, yeah, they were, but they're not any longer. They're from Asia now. And um, if you plant one in your yard, oh darn, your bird feeder is empty. And you've taken up all of this space with st basically sterile, a sterile choice that you've made. Um, the, the, uh, the goal in placing natives in your yard is to get to 70% of the, um, the vegetation being native vegetation. That means the green material in the tree or the bush or the, or the ground cover. If you're putting in something like a tree, that could be on a small lot, that could be 50% of your biomass in that one tree. So choose wisely. Uh, don't don't, please don't choose ginkgo. All right, native prunus supports 240 species of caterpillar. Nandina, which I don't know about you, but in my area in Medford, Nandina is planted in almost every yard. Um, they don't support caterpillars. It, it doesn't host anything. And the berries are toxic to cedar waxwings because of the way cedar waxwings feed. Robin can come by this plant in the dead of winter when there's nothing else to eat and can eat 10 berries and fly on and be fine. Cedar waxwings will come to a food source like this and they will gorge. They will eat until they can't fit any more of the food in their crops. Those berries then contain cyanide and the birds fly off and they die. So Audubon has asked people to remove Nandina or at least remove the berries from the plants because they kill cedar waxwings. Here's Pieris Chuponica, non-native, doesn't host much, much of anything. Here's our native Viburna. You could plant that instead and have 31 species of caterpillar available for bird food and berries for birds to eat, the adult birds to eat later. So choose a native when you can. Here's our Oregon grape, early bloomer again plant choice matters. This is a link to the National Wildlife Foundation. And if you go to this link and type in your, um, your zip code, you will find the list of plants that host and they're, and they're listed by uh, number of Lepidoptera hosted. Um, and you can choose plants for your yard based on this. You can also go to OregonFlora.org um, and they have a garden site 
where you can do the same thing. You can ask, uh, get information about plants. So we removed half the lawn. We've taken out the invasives. We've planted natives. Now step four is avoid or minimize the use of insecticides and fungi, uh, fungicides. So pesticides, pesticides are herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. Um, you want to reduce or avoid all of those because if you're, if you're spraying herbicides, um, those have down, downstream effects on, on uh, insect life. Insecticides, of course, kill things outright. So I'll have people buy milkweed from me in the native plant nursery out at, the, out, out at Extension. And then they come and they go, <clears throat> I've got aphids on my milkweed. What should I spray it with? And I go, well, don't spray it with anything because if you spray the, the, uh, the aphids, you're going to kill the butterfly larva that you planted the milkweed to get. So um, people, people kind of don't think through all the steps and we need to always stop and think before we make any kind of a decision. So these, these insecticides, um, if you're growing natives, you should need far fewer of any of these kinds of products um, and they should be applied uh, probably the, the, the worst offenders are people with home gardens because they haven't been trained to use them and they use them incorrectly and uh, the consequences are pretty dire. So um, if you see one of these names on an insecticide, if you go to the, um, the nursery and you want to avoid a neonicotinoid, which is the systemic insecticide that you drench the plant with and a plant takes it up into its tissues. Um, but, but it's never listed on the label as a neonicotinoid. You're looking for this name. It's not there under this name. It's there under these names. And so the active ingredient will be one of these, which I can't even biocopred, blah, blah, blah. These, you have to know these names and know that these are the systemics that will get into the plant tissues, get into the pollen and nectar that these are using to feed their young and mess with navigation skills in insects. Um, they're, they're really problematic. So use of insecticides should be very, very, very limited. It, uh, this is what happens with these. Um, we, we apply them to the plant and the target pests are sap sucking and burrowing and leaf miner insects. And the plant takes up about two to 20% of that, um, of what we apply. The rest of it goes directly into the soil. Now that it's in the soil, it's going to affect any kind of soil uh, organisms. Um, and it's going to leach into streams where it will then affect aquatic insects those aquatic insects can be eaten by fish in the stream and it affects the fish. Um, and because these insects are being killed off, we have food source depletion. So birds and fish and amphibians have less to eat um, and, and, and are directly poisoned by uh, it, insects that have been poisoned by this stuff. And some of it you know, runs off into the stream, causing more destruction in the stream. So, and of course it always hits the non-target uh, organisms. You wanted to get the sucking insects over here that were eating your cucumber or whatever. And instead you're affecting the honeybees and the butterflies and the moths. It's a very, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a Pandora's box that, um, that we've opened and uh, need to be very careful with. Here's our Douglas spirea. Um, it's a wet site. It likes kind of riparian area, damp sites, lakesides, streamsides. Um, it hosts a lot. It's a member of the rose family and hosts a ton of insects. Great plant. Um, so when you choose native plants for your yards, focus on these two groups of insects, the caterpillars, the butterflies and moths, which we've already talked about. Check and check. We're done there. And pollinators. So step five is to build a pollinator garden. And here's, this is what most people think of when they think of a pollinator garden. They're not thinking about trees and shrubs. 
although those trees and shrubs are also producing pollen and nectar that our bees utilize. Our native bees utilize the pollen and nectar from our native shrubs and trees. But here's Pearly Everlasting. Um, it's one of our natives and it, and it hosts a lovely butterfly. Oh, I guess I should show you part of this. Um, what I tell people is, what is eye candy to you is not to insects that are coming over your yard. Don't pick out the flowers based on what it looks good to you. Um, I want to show you this because insects see with ultraviolet vision and they also sense the environment through chemical receptors in their legs and antenna and and they're smelling the environment and they're looking at it with different eyes. So I just want to show you this little clip. This is called Insecta Spectra. And it compares human, butterfly, and bee vision. So here's the first thing you'll see is human vision. The second is butterfly vision. And the third is bee vision. So that's what a flower looks like to us. Here's what it looks like to a butterfly. And then there's what it looks like to a bee. So it's really calling those insects into the center of that flower. Uh, human, butterfly, it looks totally different, right? To, to the insect and bee. get the point. If you change the color of the flower, you are affecting the insect's ability to even see that flower or be attracted to it. So who are our major pollinators? Well, we have uh, one, one species of honeybee uh, that's non-native. So you have to think of honeybees as like, mm, they're like the cows of the insect world, right? We like them and we like the product they produce, but they are not the end all and be all for pollination. And these are just a, a handful of our native, our little native pollinators. And it's not just bees that do pollinating services, beetles and flies and all kinds of things. So 4,000 species of native bee and 14,000 species of moths and butterflies. And most of the pollination services that the Lepidoptera do are at night. When you're sleeping, those moths are out pollinating stuff. And it's really important that we keep them around. Okay, bees are critical for pollination needs, so we want to plan for them. So the most productive native plant gen genera for native bee specialists, and you go, well, Lynn, what's a native bee specialist? What does that mean? That means that these native bees have to eat a certain, they have to collect a certain type of pollen to grow their young in. They collect nectar and pollen, they form it into a ball, they lay, it's called a, a bee bread or a bee ball, and they, they stash that somewhere. They lay an egg on it, and the larva grows eating that combination of nectar and pollen. So um, goldenrod has 11 species of native bee that can only utilize the pollen from that plant. Willows, there are eight species of native bee that can only use willow. Asters, seven species. Blueberries, five you see that there, we have these native species that must have these plants or they can't reproduce. Really, really a critical and new piece of information um, that we've been getting with all the new bee research that's been going on recently. So you have 40 species of specialist bees on just seven varieties of plants. If you can plant these plants in your yard, these things, and by the way, any, any sunflower that's helianthus will work. They're all North American natives. And so the sunflowers that you grow in your garden in the summer are, are pulling in these native sunflower bees. If you plant these species, you'll get 40 species of specialist bee on just those seven plant varieties. And generalist bees, like honeybees and bumblebees and, uh, and carpenter bees, will come to these flowers as well. So you get more than 40 species and you 
cover all the, all the ones that absolutely have to have those. So goldenrods um, host 49 species of Lepidoptera and those 11 native bee species. So goldenrod is a keystone flower that you want to have in your yard. Native and honeybees use the pollen from goldenrod to provision their nests. Monarch butterflies have to use this, uh, all, all of our migrating butterflies, because it's a late season bloomer. The monarchs and the other migrating butterflies have to use this to build up body fats as before they head south. So really, really important. So think of plant families when you're planting your butterfly garden. You want to plant some of the carrot family and that in your garden, you'll plant dill, fennel, maybe not fennel because you know it might get away, coriander and parsley, and then our native lomatiums and angelica. And these, have, these are tiny little flowers with tiny, tiny little cups. So tiny bees like Perdita and Cerastina, the little tiny, tiniest bees that are the size of a grain of rice, can get their little mouth parts into these tiny flowers. Important to plant those for those guys. Um, also for our predatory wasps and um, parasitic wasps that we want as beneficials in our yards. Um, the mustard family, you wanna plant some things from the mustard family. Plant some alyssum between your um, vegetables and um, plant some of these native wallflowers or cresses in your, in your native garden, in your, in your borders. The aster family, incredibly important. Um, goldenrod is a member of the aster family. There are lots of different members, but this is our native sunflower here in the West. It's an annual, easy to grow. It's a big bush and it has multiple uh, of these small, oh, they're about three, feet, three inches, four inches in diameter, sunflowers all over it. And you'll see sunflower bees. This is Madia elegans, beautiful dry land. If you have star thistle on your property, cut it down in the spring, spread Madia elegans seeds, and um, let those grow up and shade out the star thistle on your property. Um, this is our Douglas Aster. The mint family, you wanna choose some things from the mint family. We sell uh, horse mint and monardella in our native plant nursery at the, um, at the SORAC campus, but you're also growing these in your garden, in your vegetable garden. Um, those are, those are really helpful. Um, bunch grasses. Um, I grow Romer's fescue and California fescue and a couple other different bunch, native bunch grasses in the nursery. And, and <clears throat> I, I just recently started growing bunch grasses because I became aware of how important they are. Our little skipper butterflies have to overwinter and, and reproduce in these bunch grasses. So if you don't have native bunch grasses in your yard, you're not going to have those adorable little skipper butterflies. So try and include um, bunch grasses, native bunch grasses in your landscape plants. Um, choose native plants if they can work in your yard. For some people, um, maybe they're not, you know, you can't do everything. You're going to have a mix of stuff. Um, but see if you can get to that 70%. It's really a good target. Avoid native bars and cultivars that have different flower color than the native plant. We saw from that video that if you change the flower color, if you plant the orange, the, the Cheyenne sunset echinacea, right? Um, <laughs> the, the bees are gonna fly over, the butterflies are gonna fly over, they're not gonna see it. They're not, they don't, the, the color change changes the way they can, see and find those plants. And avoid plants that have um, a different leaf color. So things like this beautiful elderberry, it looks gorgeous, but it's giving, it's giving off a chemical odor that um, the insects won't recognize because of the anthocyanins that are in that, that make that leaf color. They are looking for this. They are smelling for this. They are looking for this. And then double flowers, please don't plant double flowers. Uh, you've got to have a landing platform for your insects and there's no pollen and nectar uh, available to any creature in these little pom-poms here. These are, sterile, um, these are sterile flowers because this is an elaboration of the sexual parts of the flower. That's this part of the flower that has been made into this 
and rendered um, inaccessible and, and or sterile. So don't plant double flowers. I know you love them. Don't do it. <laughs> Pollinators need plants that bloom over a long period of time. So you want to think of spring through fall. Some, we have some things like manzanita that will actually start blooming in January. And manzanita is a great, great um, pollen and nectar source for bumblebees. We need to choose a variety of blooming annuals, perennials, ground covers, herbs, shrubs, trees that bloom across all seasons. We need to plan food and nesting opportunities for our, our insects and our birds. And bees need to, what do they need to reproduce? They have to have pollen and nectar. Uh, we have 1,600 species in the Pacific Northwest, and it says 500 plus species, but uh, most recently it's up to close to 800 species of native bee have been discovered in Oregon. So where do they nest? They nest mostly in the ground. Um, probably about 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. They nest in woody stems and pithy stems and hollow stems. Um, Here's what a pithy stem nester looks like. They actually drill into a stem and they build chambers in there for their for laying their eggs. So here's uh, woody stems. These are mason bee combs. You probably have seen these with a the little mud dividing the each individual um, pollen loaf with an egg on it. Um, this is our mason bee, our blue uh, mason bee osmia. This is our leaf cutter bee. This is our wool carter bee. Well, actually, this is probably a European wool carter bee. Um, uh, she collects the fuzz off plants and makes these chambers. This is a resin bee. So she's collecting a resin, resinous material from plants. And these are her larvae in each of their individual cells growing and, and developing. Here's what the leaf cutter bee does. This is what the mason bee does. These are the pupa of the mason bee. They've eaten their pollen balls and they're just waiting for spring to come and emerge from those um, tubes. The ground nesting bees, we have so many of those. Um, if you're gonna put up bee houses in your yard, I, uh, I, I, a, a word of warning about those. People love to put these things up. They look cool and you think you're doing great stuff for the bees and you are if you change these every year. If you, if you um, move them and, and clean them and keep them clean. Um, the, the problem is if you're putting this many bees together, guess what's gonna find them? Um, predators, parasites, and a disease. So bee hotels and commercial bee houses have problems. They concentrate your bees and attract their predators and parasites. These are mites, these are, um, hairy-footed pollen mites on a blue orchard mason bee. Um, really, really sad. She's just covered with them. I don't know how she's even surviving or flying. Um, they, they have to be maintained. So these little houses that you get that look so cute, um, you have to clean them. You have to clean them and sterilize them each year. Um, otherwise, you, they're gonna have problems. They concentrate disease, um, mold, uh, funguses, all kinds of things native plants, if you leave the stems up in your yard around and you plant stuff around your yard, the bees will find the hollow stems or the pithy stems and they'll nest in those and they'll be far enough apart that they're not going to be found by predators and parasites and disease agents. So they spread the bees out in the landscape. Safer for the bees, better for them, healthier. Step six, leave the leaves. This is a Xerxes sort of call to arms Xerxes Society um, is asking people to leave the leaves in their landscapes. And people, I know you like your yards neat and tidy, um, but we have to stop thinking of um, leaves as litter. They're not litter, they're habitat. 70 species of moth and caterpillar eat dead leaves, fungi and lichen. They're eating that stuff. They have to have it as food. Um, the leaves are not litter, they are habitat. So leave the leaves. Um, many species of moss and butterfly overwinter in leaves or in the soil underneath an insulating layer of leaves. So leave the leaves. Um, thousands of species of native flies breed in decaying veg vegetation. Um, and everybody goes, oh, flies, I don't want flies in my yard. Yes, you do. Yes, yes, you do. 
you want flies because those are winter bird food. And so this is a black soldier fly. It is completely harmless. It looks a little bit like a wasp to some people, but it's not, it's a fly there. Or it's grubby little larva. Um, and they are, boy, that's, that's like a, a big old bratwurst for a, a, a baby bird. And it's for a lizard in a compost pile or, um, you know, a bird that's hunting food in the, in the winter. These are full of fat and protein. So leave the leaves, the flies are good guys. Um, the fly larvae are critical nutritious food for many animals and particularly in the winter. This is a long legged fly, very cute. And he's your buddy, you'll see him in your garden. He's eating fungus gnats and aphids and thrips, all of which you don't want on your vegetables. Flies are our second most important pollinating group after bees. So if you think you don't want flies, you're just wrong, you do. <laughs> All right, these are surfed flies, the hover flies that you um, see that look like bees, but it's not, that's an eye, that's a fly eye if I ever saw one. That's what that guy is. That's a little fly mimicking a bee and that's her larva. And look at what the larva is eating. Aphids, they're voracious predators. So these little flies not only do pollination services as adults, they are, they are beneficial insects in your garden to remove the bad guys that you don't like. Um, here's, here's, um, oops, sorry, somebody's calling me. I have turned that off. I apologize for that. This is a woodpecker who is drilling into a, a gall in a stem. There's a, there's a wasp uh, larva in there and that woodpecker knows that and is and is foraging for that in winter. If the stems had been taken down, there goes that guy's food. Um, here's a goldfinch eating the seed heads out of some artichoke. It looks like artichoke or some kind of sunflower thistle um, um, head and um, winter food. But if somebody had cleaned that up in this in the fall, then the bird doesn't have winter food. So leave the stems leave the seed heads, leave the leaves, build a brush pile for protection for some of these guys. If you have property, big property, and you're taking down trees, leave some of those logs in the environment because they provide incredible habitat for amphibians, reptiles, even small mammals, um, fungi uh, opportunities, opportunities for fungi to get established. Uh, Plan for water, cover nesting sites and food. And then step seven, the final step is to turn out the lights. Um, we have a huge problem with light pollution in, all over the world. You've seen pictures of the earth from space at night and you've seen how we have lit up the landscape. Leaving lights on at night really confuses and exhausts nighttime pollinators, all our moths. And they exhaust themselves, they don't reproduce properly. They can't forage for food, so they starve. So if you, if you can, at your house, use motion sensor lights in your yard. Or if you have to leave the lights on, install yellow LED lights. They're less dangerous than these white and blue tone lights. Um, motion sensor lights are great because for the most part, they come on for 15 seconds when something's moving around your yard. And, um, and then they go out when the motion stops. So if the bad man is coming and you're worried about the bad man and that's why you have a floodlight on your driveway, put a motion sensor light. When the light comes on, the bad man will get scared that you see him and will go away. And uh, uh, as, as I've often said, you'd be surprised how many times the bad man isn't coming at night to our neighborhoods and houses. I mean, for the most part, uh, it's not happening. So the motion sensor lights will, will actually be useful in, uh, in illuminating those individuals who might be checking car doors or whatever. Um, so, but really, really important that we provide a dark environment for our nighttime pollinators to do their really important services. So you can save nature if you learn to live with it. 
Um, and you can save the world and certainly you can save nature in your yard. Um, so make America native again. And if you want a PDF of the, this, uh, that's my email address and I'm happy to send you a copy. It will come in two parts because there's so much in the slide deck. And I will also attach the, um, the um, handouts that I give um, at when I do a live presentation. And then there are lots of resources here for you to look at. Um, and I, I invite all of you to come out to Extension any Wednesday, uh, except August 9th, um, and check out the native plant nursery that uh, we have out there. And I'm ready for questions. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you, Lynn. Wonderful. Sure. Just great. Super inspirational. And you have some nice uh, questions. People want to drill into the details. So I will um, share these with you. So John says, I was surprised to see Yarrow on both lists. Are there some better than others? Well, we have a native Yarrow. Western Yarrow, uh, uh, common Yarrow is our Western uh, native. And, and it may be, it's probably going to be chemi a little bit chemically different from the yarrow you buy in the nursery because the yarrow in the nursery is um, grown for those pretty colors of the flower, right? <laughs> Which is not what the insects are looking for. And, and it's going to give off a different chemical signature. And it's obviously going to, going to appear different to them as they're flying over the site and looking for it visually. If they're, if they're a, an insect that wants yarrow, they're gonna be looking for the common uh, Western native yarrow that's white. And I grow that in the nursery, by the way, so you can get it from me. <laughs> Wonderful. There's nothing like shameless self-promotion here. No, it's great. No, you're what, what you guys do is wonderful. And I'm, I'm so happy to see it all the time. And I've gotten a, a lot of plants there myself. Um, right. I just dropped a link in the chat and Lynn will, uh, provide, you know, this resource to me and I'll share it with folks who are registered in an email that contains the link to the recording. <clears throat> but there's a Google link for a document um, that has a, a number of different resources, some of which Lynn was uh, mentioning here, but they're all really great resources for native plants, things that I put together for um, other classes different times. So you can look at that if you're in a hurry and can't wait for this uh, information from Lynn. Um, next question. Let's see, I have wanted to plant mountain lilac, lilac ceanothus, probably intergeramus, but could not find a source. Do you have one? Are you guys planting that yet? I don't I, know. I, I have not grown that in the nursery, but you know, we have a terrific um, native plant nursery in talent called Plant Oregon. And I refer people there. First of all, you go there. And if they don't have it, and they do restoration, they, they grow a lot, thousands and thousands and thousands of plants there. They very well might have it there. Um, I, can't, I don't know for sure. They have an excellent website and you can check it before you go and see if they grow that particular one. But there are also um, nurseries up in the Willamette Valley that grow um, a lot of these things that I, I have a very limited palette at the nursery. <laughs> at extension, I just grow what I can get seed of growing, or, yes. of, you know, so uh, <clears throat> but plant Oregon, I would say is is the first stop uh, on, on your shopping uh, adventures. There's um, the Native Plant Society of Oregon, our Siskiyou chapter of the Native Plant Society. If you just uh, let's see, I think the you can either go to the web page or you can go to our Facebook page. And we have a list that's up that has a lot of different resources for plant materials. So there, there are a number, I mean, there are good nurseries and then some organizations, including the Master Gardeners, will have plant sales different times, the Understory Initiative, the Rogue Native Plant Partnership, sometimes right. other folks. So um, that's, a, that's a great resource of, that we try to keep updated and you can look for that as well. Um, Perfect. Okay, let's see here. Jenny says, how do you navigate, oops, the spreading characteristics of lupin and aster species in smaller residential areas and yards? <laughs> uh, uh, well, it, it, you, you probably need to do selective weeding if you've got a garden thug type native plant. And they, and they are, I mean, our natives wanna grow and some of them grow quite vigorously. If you've ever planted native 
showy milkweed. It, it runs 30 feet on you and all of a sudden you've got a new sprout coming up next to the driveway where you never had planted it. So um, yeah, you just have to be vigilant and, um, and dedicated to, to, to knowing that you're doing the right thing by growing those things, even if they are being bullies in your yard. <laughs> It's a good problem to have is how I like yeah, to think of it. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, let's see here. Um, and somebody recommended the Soil and Water Conservation Districts host annual plant sales and typically carry Ceanothus. Oh, so great. here's Clackamas. I'm not sure that our Jackson County does, but I know we're reaching people all over. But right. I, don't know if they, I know that occasionally they'll have plants, but I don't think Jackson County has a nursery, right. but they have great know. resources. If you go to their web page and you're looking for species, you kind of, it's a little bit buried in there, but if you go into the resources, they have great plant lists and native right. plants for different contexts right. and stuff. Yeah. But thank you. Thanks folks for sharing resources. That's great use of the chat. Um, can you put your email in the chat again, please? Maybe you can drop it right into the chat for folks. Let's yeah. see, there's that document. Um, and John says it's on, the, it's on the screen right now. Um, okay, great. Uh, I'll put it in here. Let me get to everybody, everybody in the meeting. Yeah, and then maybe after a minute, you might want to stop sharing um, your yeah. screen after a bit after folks have a chance to write it down. Um, okay, help you finish that up, and there then is. so John says. How do you envision climate change affecting what we consider native? Yeah, it's a big, um, it's a big issue. Um, the, the, the recommendation that I've heard from Dr. Talmy, because this question comes up to him all the time, is, is um, to continue um, planting what's native in your area, and um, I know some people are talking about doing assisted migration, you know, and moving plants north. Um, and some of that is going on. But um, really, I think that the feeling is that at this point, we want to plant the things that are locally adapted and, and, and those that can survive the heat increases and those kinds of things will produce fruit you know, flower and fruit, and, and then those offspring should be able to maybe um, deal with the coming changes. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a really dicey issue. I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I have the expertise to address that, but it, it is being talked about uh, um, broadly in, in many circles, uh, uh, ecological circles, because people are concerned about that very issue so yeah you know one thing to consider here where we live at least uh folks that are in our area in the klamath siskiyous this the embedded in the natives here is a really long genetic history of climate change that's come and gone with ice ages and many plants have been here we have paleo endemic species that have been through multiple kind of ice ages and changes and um, so those genetics, that diversity is embedded in the natives here. And so definitely don't abandon the natives. I think, yep. you know, yeah. still be strong on the natives. And then if you want to experiment, like look for sort of nearby natives, like what are the models predicting our, our climate will kind of nudge towards and, and maybe plant some of those things, but sure. definitely keep planting the natives and locally sourced native seeds as well right. when you can get them, you know, not a lot of times you know what you're getting is seed source from the willamette valley and so that's like a very different climate they are very about, different so. that's a very different climate yeah are, <laughs> you're, you're better off buying if you're buying seed you're better off buying seed from northern california because we are in the california floristic it, basically we are we are the same uh eco region as the gold country of the sierra foothills so the Rogue Valley is very unique in Oregon. Um, it's, it's like living in Mariposa, California or Placerville or one of those gold country towns. That's the climate that we have here in the Rogue Valley. So, so plants from Northern California are better adapted for us than 
Um, and, and in fact, we share a lot of the same flora from California um, than we do with, with the Willamette Valley. Willamette Valley, those plants are adapted to high, higher moisture content you know, in their soils yeah. and, and right. higher rainfall and all those things. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I actually grow quite a few of, of plants from, um, from California um, and specifically that foothill region. And I also, um, there's, a, there's a willow, a small willow that I grow from the Southwest. It's, it's endemic to Arizona and that, and that area but it's small and so it can be put in small yards and it needs a little less water than most willows. So I do have that, that I, that I will propagate in the nursery, um, you know, for people who really want to have a willow, but they can't put a, one of our scholars willows or something. You know? Yeah. One of our native willows are just, they're stream side plants. Well, um, the scholars willow is actually kind of an upland species. Like if you find a willow away from the river, it's going to be the scholars willow. So that scholars, is right. the one that is right. a, a better one. So um, yeah, that's, that's a good one for us. So here, uh, so, uh, again, Jeannie's saying plant organ did not have it recently. And I haven't checked, or the, I think the deer brush, but, uh, uh, or deer bush. And I haven't, I haven't run into it. I mean, I haven't thoroughly looked, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, but that I'm, kind of segues into another uh, topic that folks who have land or know folks who have land, um, kind of learning to experiment with saving your own native seed and trying with native plants is another great way when you can't find things like go ahead and give it a try if you can find the seeds. We're going to have a class um, you know, sometimes they're offered by different people. We have one coming up, and Marcy might remember when exactly. I think coming up maybe in December by Susie Savoy. Master Gardeners just did it with um, about propagating native plants. Yeah, from she's so, she's wonderful. She's yeah. the owner of Clamasisku Native Seeds, and she is yes, right, right, fantastic. So right. for sure, she is somebody to um, to see. Uh, yeah, and and she has a lot of knowledge and. And she would be able to tell you, how, you know, how to gather those seeds or, um, and I, I do a lot of propagation from cuttings. So I've never tried with deer brush because I don't have any deer brush nearby that I can go take cuttings from. Um, and I'm not sure when in the year that has to happen because it happens at different times for different plants. But um, taking cuttings, if you have land, learn how to propagate from cuttings and, um, and your own seed. I, I just... And, and learn about stratification. I'm going to be doing a seed stratification class in the greenhouse, I think in November. We're going to be planting the seeds that we're going to be, going to be selling in May. We're going to be planting them in November um, in a class I'm doing uh, in greenhouse too. Nice. So. Wonderful. Um, and this is another kind of version of that. John says, do you have a source for Klamath plum? That's another one I don't see very often. And frankly, strangely, I don't often see plums on it. Like I see it huh. in the wild all the time, but I, you had that beautiful picture with all those plums and I've seen yeah. that in books that I've never seen a plant like that. So well, it's everywhere, <laughs> it's reproducing, but I don't yeah. know who's eat, if the birds are getting the plums before Somebody, I see somebody's them. Somebody's eating those, the bears are eating them and pooping them out in the woods in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I'm kind of curious about that. Yeah, okay, so there's I, your email and, uh, and Marcy says Susie Savoy is in November, November 8th, propagating native seeds from yeah, um, native started. plants from seeds. Yeah. And she also sells seeds. So that's another source. And I'll try to look. I think I might have another resource list um, that yeah, I'll she's got a She's got a nice you website know. and you can go and order seeds from her and they come in like a couple of days. So they, she's fast. She's right here locally and she goes out and collects. Uh, she has collecting permits. She's, she's wonderful. It's, it's where I get the seeds for the nursery. Um, I buy from Susie. So yeah, and she and the Rogue Native Plant Partnership have um, their websites are very informative and have information about you know seeding directly into the ground or cleaning seeds and different things. So lots of really great resources if you want to go full plant nerd and really become your own source of plants. Yeah, like, like there's I a do. lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I think we are out of questions here, but thank you, Lynn. That was really great. I'm so glad, Absolutely. and I'm glad that we have it captured on a uh, recording so that I can oh, share. Good, it with people. yeah, yeah. I stumbled around, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, terrific, really wonderful. Good, great. Thank you, you all. You for did coming. Doug Tallamy proud. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, that's great. <clears throat>
Okay, and some thank yous there, and hopefully um, folks got what they needed. And we had, I think, about 45 people registered, so a lot of people will will watch the recording. We'll watch it later, yeah, yeah. sure. Great. Exactly. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, I will close the Zoom and see you all later. All right, thanks okay. a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.